Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 65 of The Hard Truth About B2B E-Commerce. I'm Timothy Peterson. It's great to have you here today. Uh, and we've got a really exciting day ahead for you, a uh, really exciting guest. Uh, and now I'd like to introduce you to our my co-host. But before that, there is a pause for our sponsors. Our first sponsor is punch out to go punch out to go is a global B2B integration company specializing in connecting commerce business platforms with e-procurement and ERP applications. Punch out to go's iPass technology seamlessly links business applications to automate the flow of purchasing data. With their solution, you can immediately reduce integration complexities for punch out catalogs, electronic purchase orders, invoices, and other B2B sales order automation documents in order to accelerate business results. Balance is our other sponsor. Balance is a B2B e-commerce payment solution that works well for you and your buyers. It offers a seamless one-click checkout for almost any payment method, including ACH, wire, checks, cards, even terms. It's used by leaders in B2B e-commerce, and it's as easy as buying a shirt from Amazon. Check them out at getbalance.com, book a session, and tell them what your needs are. They are the first dedicated payment platform for B2B e-commerce, 100% tailored to your needs. Thanks again to our sponsor, Balance. Well, now that you've heard from our sponsors, I'm our other co-host, Isaiah Bollinger, uh, CEO of Trellis, and super excited about our guest today, Jordan Knapp, who uh, many people probably know, or some people may know from the Shopify ecosystem, but there's a pretty big history there, Jordan. I think you said you started e-commerce in high school or you know, shortly after high school, then you know, did a bunch of things. We're at ATG in the early Oracle days, or Oracle bought ATG, and then I went to Magento and then Shopify. So you've kind of seen the ecosystem evolve. And that's a lot of what I want to talk about because not a lot of people have the historical context going back 20 years. <laughs> the pre-platform days. <laughs> No, and you, B2B projects have always been the most interesting to me because it's a lot, there's just a lot more technical complexity. And yeah. like, I'm, I love the working on with digital, like digital marketing and customer retention and convert, you know, but like the B2B stuff is just a lot of fun to, to try to problem solve. Um, so, so Jordan, let's make sure that our, uh, our listeners know, uh, you know, Isaiah gave us a really good intro, but tell us, tell us more about you and your background and and this arc, you know, all of these great places. I used to work on ATG platforms and all that kind of stuff too. So just, just give us a little bit more for our listeners to uh, eat up. Sure, yeah, no, I think like like literally back in high school, I was playing video games and I think my my parents were like, that's worthless and what are you doing with your time? And I was like, oh, this is the future. And a lot of it was almost just like teenage spite. I wanted to prove that I could make money, um, you know, and then it's addictive when you're 16 and 17 advising adults on, on their business strategy when you really have no idea what you're talking about, but you have, <laughs> you know. Like, um, so I was just started building websites at a young age. And then it only, it let, I didn't even think of it as e-commerce at the time. It was basically just like, it wasn't even like, you know, it was certainly like, never let, forget PCI compliance. It wasn't even like, it wasn't even a secure transaction, but you know, just like basic order. It was almost like online ordering for people. Sure, and sure. then um, did that through college. Cause it was like, you know, your money and better than working at the restaurant or bar or something like that. And I wish never, I had your uh, entrepreneur spirit back then. I was, uh, I, <laughs> I figured that out after college, but not during college. <laughs> there you go. Well, and then the funny thing that was, that was my last probably entrepreneurial. Well, and then I did, you know, I did consulting for years and then um, took a job at like a company that got bought by autonomy. So we were building um, basically go to market, so like a, uh, online solutions for life insurance companies and annuities. Um, and through that experience, ended up going to ATG Commerce. Mm -hmm. So it was at ATG from the early days. I knew it was an, e I mean, of course I knew it was an e-commerce company at the time, but ATG, I think people forget was so much more. It was one of the first J2 double, like uh, J2 double application servers. A lot of their business was like, was like customer support and service, not just transactional e-commerce. 
Um, and then, you know, right as I was getting there, it was sort of shop ACG going through the soul searching of we're an e-commerce company. This is what we do. Um, was there through was multiple roles, sales engineer, sales rep led uh, uh, the solutions engineering team for the retail business unit at Oracle in the end. Um, and then joined, followed my boss, Lisa Butler, to eBay. Um, and it was really, it was like eBay Enterprise at the time. And they had had, we were building across eBay team. So we would get involved in pro, even like projects with PayPal and others. Um, but, um, you know, uh, my boss, Lisa, at the time was spending a lot of time with eBay executives, helped bring basically what was GSI, eBay Enterprise and Magento together. So that was like, I couldn't have been more excited just to have any, you know, anyone at that time understood what Magento was and the influence it had. It was never very good at making money. Like it never made any money. But it, was, <laughs> it was like literally well, just- so heavily open source. Some of our biggest customers are still using the open source and they make $0 on that. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a giant open, sorry, just a quick anecdote because mm -hmm. I think it's relevant. We had a giant uh, open source customer and we, were, we wanted them to understand the benefits of enterprise. And this was not too long ago because a lot of the things we were building in open source were in the enterprise. So we were basically rebuilding features in enterprise. And they basically, the, the CEO was like, if you guys need to use enterprise, we're just going to fire you. We, we, have, we don't want to do it. We just want to pay you. <laughs> so like, we just want to pay. We don't want to pay for a license. Just build it. And that's, that's it. So like if we made them use enterprise, they would have fired us. So basically like the customer forced us to use open source, even though like they want to be, <laughs> they're using the features that we had to build that were the same. <laughs> so like they definitely had a little bit of a struggle with the, the business model. <laughs> Their own customers are like refusing to use the paid version. <laughs> I think that was like the challenge with, with, with um, selling any open with produce like leading the development of any open source software is like, if it's truly open source and if anyone can use it, and there's a lot of like fake open source where people say this is open source, but they're not really, you know, yeah. these, but if it's truly open source, how do you monetize it? So I think, I think that was the struggle for Magento for a lot of years was like, sure. you know, hundreds of thousands of stores, but how many of them actually, you know, yeah, how many fraction, did they, how was, paid yeah. them any money? Yeah. Um, and that was a lot of what we did was certainly, you know, helping Magento move up market, you know, feature set for Magento 2. Most of my, my time was mostly solutions engineering, but we got involved in lots of projects. Um, one of my, I guess I got to name Luma, which was cool, which was the Magento 2 reference store. Sure. Um, we still use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, um, so when you were at eBay, were you working on store of the future projects uh, along with uh, some other teams? Because I was involved in some of that back then. I, my good buddy, Bill Tarbell was, um, he, yes. he, oh, so, so Bill, basically he's what, like, I've known same fraternity college, you know, mm -hmm. like seven different employers or something ridiculous. Like, so Bill, um, Bill was getting involved a lot with the, inc the innovation labs and they were helping to design a lot of the experience and then using the Luma brand to create like the customer journey across eBay products. So, that was a lot of fun. That was good stuff. Yeah. It was really cool. They did well before Rebecca Minkoff was on Shopify. They did the, mm -hmm. the store of the future. You know, eBay did like the the touchscreen uh, yep. mirrors and things like that at the Rebecca Minkoff store. Yeah, they also did uh, a project. I think it was at, um, oh my God, uh, I'm trying to remember, Kate Spade, because oh, that no, was it. Right. Because I got involved in that one where, and Isaiah, just, just for everybody's reference, this is fascinating. I wish more people actually do this now but what they did is they put touchscreen windows at the kate spade store in new york city so literally you go to the window tap the window of the store and whatever's on display in the mannequin you put in your e-commerce cart oh, and wow. it was brilliant and i was like where is it when is it going to explode everywhere in retail it never did and i was amazed by that <laughs> no, one, it was such ever, a good no one ever figured out how to scale that probably it's probably Probably it was, so, it was fun. <laughs> it was a fun idea, though. It really was fun. And I yeah. think they even had like same like one hour fulfill. Like you could buy the product while you're at the touch screen, and someone would bring it to you. Yep. And track you based upon your phone or yeah. I, I, I actually did the test. They brought it to my office in the city, so I bought it, you know, and the thing, and then I went back to my office and they delivered it, and it was like great one hour delivery you know it was just a funny idea you know and i wish they'd kind of continue with that sorry for the aside but it was such oh, a good yeah. moment it was such an interesting yeah. idea 
Yeah, no, eBay was doing all sorts of cool stuff. And then, you know, I don't know if the holistic vision of eBay, all these products together was going to work out or not, but then Carl Icahn spoiled everybody's fun by going in and just chopping up eBay into 50 different pieces. Yeah. And well, now PayPal is worth way more than eBay. Yeah. Oh, I think yeah. that was the, the vision. He's like, we need to get PayPal out of here because I'm going to make all my money back on PayPal. And, you yeah. know, uh, eBay's got a lot of problems, obviously, that eBay Enterprise. Were you still there for the eBay Enterprise split off and when Gento split off or? I started, I almost went to big commerce in like, I think it was like summer 2015 or I can't remember the exactly when. And then I, just before everything got split apart, I was when I went to Shopify. So like fall of 2015. Gotcha. And what, what was your, I mean, it just, you just saw better opportunity there or you want to try something different or what was your. I had been, I'd started, I think it was big commerce. I discovered first, like someone told me you got to try these new SaaS e-commerce platforms yeah. and if you mentioned them to anyone anyone's everyone's eyes would roll and go well that's never gonna work in a SaaS environment and I think I was I I think it was like big commerce I was using that I was like oh, oh my god like we're all so full of shit this is much easier than we thought <laughs> and I am like so I became enamored just with like even Volusion you know Volusion big commerce and Shopify and I wasn't, I never thought, I'm sorry. <laughs> Go ahead, sorry, yeah. I said Volusion sucks, I'm sorry. I well, Volusion like... does suck, but like, <laughs> like, Volusion does suck, but at least there was a time when it was like, it, could, it probably could have been a viable option. I worked on it in 2012, uh, and I knew it wasn't the future though. <laughs> they always had I a lot of issues. on Volusion. I bet my company on Magento, basically almost exactly what you did, and bet on Magento in 2012, but then saw the writing on the wall with Shopify in 2015, mm -hmm. pushed as hard as I could into Shopify in 2015, 16, acquired GrowthSpark in 2018, because mm -hmm. they had all the Shopify talent that we had a little bit more limited, kind of combined our portfolios in Shopify. And that really, it's kind of the same exact thing. We're like, oh crap, like these super complicated Magento sites we can do for way cheaper in Shopify for like 50% of the use cases. And now it's probably like 80% of the use cases, so. <laughs> Myself we're, both on B2C. We're, we're way on B2C right now. I know we're off time. Yeah. These are mostly yep, yep. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> but it's but important for people to understand this kind of trajectory because I think people make these short term decisions. They don't necessarily see the, the big picture where things are going. Yeah. Right. Well, I think the, the, the market's changed where it used to be that people would create these spreadsheets of like 50 different requirements and whoever checked all the boxes, who is usually the organization that had the least morals, you know, like mm -hmm. would be the one that people would select. And the like you just get some, it's like the Homer Simpson car where he wants like oh, a microwave. Even some agency size. Don't let me get started on that. So it's, <laughs> I think everyone gets now that like cons like you want consumability is number one. You know, like you you do custom application development or you build your own solution when you have needs that justify not choosing the most consumable solution, but you start with the consumable option first, I yeah. believe. Yeah. Well, it is it is interesting because it goes back, I used to do some ATG implementations and I'd be the guy on the ground, like in the, in, you know, the office location or whatever. And I did one with, I can mention it now because so long of a New York and company, you know, the retailer with yeah. the commerce business. ATG on demand, yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, so I did, I did that. I was the guy who did that. So it, it, taught, it cost like millions of dollars and took years yeah. and whatever. But the thing that you, that just made me want to bring that up for our listeners is that there was this giant checklist that like PwC, PricewaterhouseCoopers provided. They said, this is what we must have. I'm like, why must you decide that? Like, who, what? Like, who are you to decide this? And so it became this real weird boat of contention because I respected like what they were able to do, but they also got in the weeds in a way that didn't make sense because it wasn't about the, the end consumer. It wasn't really about a lot of the right people, you know. And like or the customer experience is completely separate than how you manage it on the back end. And yeah. they would move the, all these requirements together is just, there was no nice to haves. Everything was an absolute. Yeah. And and in the day- It's even worse. So like it has to connect with the way our ERP does this and the ERP does it in a way that the customer doesn't give a shit about your ERP, right? Like, yeah. and then they're like boxed into this like ERP logic that doesn't make sense for the customer. And then it's like, it's You're right. <laughs> yeah. The yep, B2B exactly. are infuriating, you know, it's like you get like some, 
you know, like the 1200 line mm. bullshit fit for karma RFP or something like that, where it's yeah. just the superset of everything that's of every, but like, if you, if you think about it differently, you could probably lower that requirements to like, half. Like, yeah, half half half. Half. yeah, yeah, exactly. So you, you recently left Shopify. I think maybe people don't know that. So you're, is this your first time kind of on your own now, like in a long time or? <laughs> yeah, I, I haven't ha not had a, like even before Shopify, like my last day was the week, the Friday before. And I don't think I had any time off going to eBay from mm. work. So I haven't not had a job since I was 22 or 21 or something like that. Or, you know, and now that you're 27 or 28. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, you talked about how you're super interested in, in, in B2B. Um, are you involved in any B2B stuff right now or seeing anything no, I, on that? Most of like my, my goal was I wanted to get the brand side quick and I wanted to work on probably like more complex and interesting use cases. Like Shopify has solved direct to consumer apparel, home goods, beauty. And there's a whole world of auto manufacturing, HIPAA, you know, like- Fusion, like, healthcare, yeah, man manufacturing, yeah. So, so, so all the other stuff is really one of where I spend my time, you know, because maybe I have relationships with the Shopify tech partner ecosystem, that's sort of, that's where all my time has gone pretty but it's only been three weeks you know so <laughs> <laughs> well the ecosystem, let's More talk a little bit about the ecosystem i think what you said is really really valuable it, people are still sometimes stuck in mindset does your platform do xyz and they're so focused on you know give us check out this giant list when really i think it should be more about how do we build, use a platform to jumpstart the process of having a flexible infrastructure that gets us from A, B, C to eventually Z in three to five years and using an ecosystem of partners, tech partners, agencies, customizations, like trying to do everything out of the box is probably not a very competitive business advantage, right? If, you, if your business model is, we have an e-commerce site that only does the out-of-box features of Shopify or whatever, any platform. I, I don't think you're going to be very competitive, <laughs> right? Like <laughs> you're probably not going to make a lot of money that way. <laughs> so the app partners are a huge part, I think, that people don't realize the value of, you know? Yeah. No, ecosystem is everything, you know, and there's a lot of like, there's a, there's a lot of, and I'm sure we can pick on vendors later, but you know, there's a lot of, <laughs> specific e-commerce platforms where they've got like like a pretty good product but they don't have that many agency partners and they don't have an app partner, partner ecosystem so sure. it's like so you know you could have the world's greatest samurai sword but if no one's actually able knows how to wield it then it's useless you know exactly. so if you don't have agency partners to implement it if you don't have app partners to extend the functionality then it doesn't matter how good it is and i think that's where a lot of bb companies go wrong is when you start getting deeper and i've been doing this a lot more recently um into the bb ecosystem those companies you're talking about those distributors healthcare companies they gravitate towards these weird obscure custom ERP or ERP based, you know, solutions that check a lot of the boxes that have basically no ecosystem. And then they're stuck on this platform that only does X, Y, Z. And then they try and go grow beyond that in the market ships in three years, imagine where the B2B market's going to be and the customers are going to be demanding all sorts of crazy shit, you know, and they're just not going to be able to handle that because they're stuck on this platform. Like you said, that there's one guy that knows how to wield the samurai store for that platform and he's busy because he's probably got a hundred people asking him to do work. He's maxed out. And then what are you going to train someone for five years to figure it out? Like, and so that's, I'm seeing this all the time where these companies are making the decisions, going to these platforms that have basically no ecosystem mm -hmm. or very minimal ecosystem because it checks X, Y, Z. And it's a little bit cheaper than, you know, doing a more expensive Magento project or shop, big commerce project, whatever, you know, that does have a bigger ecosystem, you know? And those firms are probably really hurting today because like, well, I'll pick on, it's B2C, but I'll pick on like the Kohl's situation recently, where yeah. it's like mm -hmm. some guy with an ego and too much testosterone goes in and I don't know who he is, so I don't want to pick on him, but like, and paints a vision of true custom development, build something from scratch. Well, like, it's so ridiculous to rebuild a shopping cart in a pricing engine 
and the checkout and payments yeah. and it's, it's yeah. insane. So like when you do that, and then all of a sudden the job market gets hot and all your developers leave, you're just doomed, you know? So yeah. it's hard with I, well, so many of these B2B implementations, you know, like unless you're using big commerce or something like that, where it's like pretty good price lists and organization contextually aware of organizations, you're basically having to custom develop or cust extend or integrate or, uh, you know, you need developers locally and it's hard to retain them. So B2B is probably harder than it's ever been. I suspect. Yeah. And then I think yeah. you have these people kind of out there being like, headless is the future. Headless is everything. Headless is going to solve the problem. And they're duping a lot of companies. Uh, in fact, Jordan, we know one together that's actually technically on a headless platform that's going to leave it. I'm not going to name any names. I want us to get in trouble. But for that exact point, it's like, they're, they're not that sophisticated. They don't have internal developers, fairly large company, but they don't have the resources to custom build all the apps and the integrations where they could just use a Shopify or BigCommerce and have a Yapo or a Clavio out of the box. They're spending like a hundred grand. I have another friend who, who left Trellis, we're still friends. He hopefully comes back. <laughs> we were talking to him about potentially going back. He's, he's working on an, uh, kind of a custom, like weird hybrid of AEM slash custom commerce. And they're spending like ridiculous money building like a Clavio integration and you know, things that should be just like fairly simple things to do, you know. So. Well, you know, the way that I've talked about this recently to people is, has changed in B2B. I mean, when I'm talking to folks in B2B, I say, you know, you don't really wall yourself off or go it alone when you're talking about sales. And you don't do this when you're talking about, you know, marketing. Why are you going to do this with e-commerce? Like, why do you want to have this? like closed system looking inward that requires all of this, you know, it's just not something that's really logical when you start breaking it out in a conversation, yet people do it. Right. Yeah. And that's, that's the thing that's shocking to me, but I think, you know, more and more people over time are kind of wising up to it because of the expense that Isaiah just said, and, you know, some other things, it just gets to be, you know, untenable. You can't do it anymore. Yeah. Well, like, um, we're, yeah, I think most organizations are their worst enemy when they like do over architect for complexity. It's like, you know, and are there reasons to go PWA or headless? Absolutely, you know, but like, you know, like you better be equipped in most yeah. very few organizations yeah. never know what they're getting into. And then they find themselves like the situation where you can't maintain your existing infrastructure and your CEO is yelling at you because the site was down for a half an hour is like the worst existence <laughs> in the world like yeah. there were many in atg vp of e-commerce who like like almost ended up in the mental institution because it's just you're trapped between a rock and a hard place it's tough yeah so it's, and I, I guess the only analogous to b2b is like well beyond the fact there's a lack of viable really consumable options today how do you pick the one that's like the most consumable and not get trapped into spreadsheet hell of 100 different of trying to accommodate and, and honestly i feel like so many of these b2b companies are like fairly strung together with like one IT guy and one operations guy, like holding yep. the entire organization together of like 200 people. And this like one IT guy gets sick or like quits. The whole company just like falls apart because he's the only guy that knows how the ERP works well. And mm -hmm. they don't really have a lot of technical talent. Like, you know, everyone else just like a salesperson or business guy that can't really like dive into it. It's just like, it's crazy when I talk to somebody, I'm like, so what about your marketing department? They're like, oh, well, like, <laughs> They're just such little resources internally in some of these B2B like organizations that are two, 300 people. That's a lot of our customer base, right? Yeah. It yeah. Just, yeah. Or they, it's like the IT guys now, the e-com manager and the ERP manager, and the, he's like doing 10 jobs and these companies just don't realize that that's what's happening. Well, I think part of the, part of the issue again, just coming in from like a consulting, you know, side of things is that, you have to you have to go through this process where you're convincing people that building out a, a marketing team or an IT team or a, you know any of these teams is an engine for growth, right? You know they're all engines that will you know no. continue to bring you to a different level as opposed to these like places where you just sink money, you know, and then and and there's some it's strange that people get into that that mode, but it's it's. It's, you know, time immemorial, you know, they'll just think that they're doing the right thing because they're stuck in their way. And there's many a manufacturer that has like a large sales organization, you know, that's doing like a lot of outbound campaigns and, but they see their IT organization in some ways as like a cost center. 
but you just paid, you know, $2 million in commissions to a bunch of salespeople who could probably be made redundant, you know? Yeah, they're if, processing orders. It's like, sure. yeah, they're paying this giant sales team and, you know, who, God knows what else they're paying to, to process orders. And it's like, eventually your competitors are going to be processing those, those orders online for practically nothing, you know, like, it's going to go through the e-commerce site and it's going to directly to the ERP and then the warehouse manager should be able to just fill the order. <laughs> well, you know, it's, it's funny how things, how some things have changed and some things haven't. I mean, I'm, I, some of the companies I work for, which I won't name, they still had secretaries, literally secretaries for sales teams, right? So they're typing in orders, you know, and I'm like, oh, you know, today, how could that even, how could that even be the case? It's like, oh my God. Like, I'm a people person, damn it. You know? <laughs> yeah, the thing that like, <laughs> is crazy to me that I don't think B2B has quite fully realized that you can actually put the cost of the order processing onto the customer and they will happily do it Mm -hmm. give them the right tools and training and experience and then all that this is absolutely all that right. cost comes off of your sales force. and now your salespeople can sell which is talk to the customer hey what else do you need or did you know we have this or here's some solutions that we offer and get more creative not just taking orders right and so <laughs> so when i lament that there's not enough like there's there's a lack of viable consumable b2b solutions for like the manufacturer or the distributor but they're they're hard sells too. I said, you know, it's not like it's, it's, um, it seems like a lengthier, more complex sales process than just selling like a B2C platform. Oh yeah. I mean, I think also some of these sales are so big, it's going to be had, hard to have them fully automated, but I think the, the website can augment that or help them build the crazy wish list or requisition list or help augment the process. Cause it's like, Forget who we were talking to. It's such a multifaceted process, right? It could be five yeah. people to place a hundred thousand dollar order. You know, it's not like one guy. Yeah, and, and over time too, as as you as you as you're saying too. I mean, it's not something like product and the cart and the credit card. You know, I mean, obviously there's so many pieces to that, and, but it's all digital. You know, I love the word enablement. I just love that word for some reason lately. It's like you know, you got to digitally enable these pieces of the process, and so that's, I think, very compelling to a lot of people in B2B. It's not because they may even have the vision of like a B2C e-commerce solution and that's what freaks them out, right? As they think it has to be that way. It's like, well, no, well, you're, you're digitally enabling each piece of this, you know, commerce process and just having things continue and happen. So, so where, where, uh, where do you see uh, things go. I mean, there's so many platforms out potentially that you could use. Um, and obviously Shopify, like you said, has kind of solved the B2C, but they're not really quite there for B2B. Like what should people be looking at I mean, community, you know, ecosystem, partner ecosystem, you know, obviously Magento is still a big player in B2B. People recognize that, but there's a lack of, it, it, there's definitely like a lack of viable options that it's, and that probably makes like the independent consultant advisor or agency like even more important than ever because you really need to understand like map the requirements to the vibe to the set of options that are out there yeah but it's shocking that there's not like a shop of, like that well that shopify and i think it's maybe because of like priceless complexity is difficult with it's like heart surgery for the platform but like mm -hmm. no one has become neither Shopify or anyone else on the market has really come up with a, with a very consumable set of B2B alternatives other than doing something that's basically on premise and custom development. Yeah. So most of the time it's like, like, you know, Magento's got some scalability issues sometimes, you know, that kind of goes away with B2B. There's a lot of situations that are like, you know, I'd be like, if you can't use big commerce, use Magento, you know? Yeah. Because, yeah. I think big commerce is the most interesting one in the sense that they have the best opportunity to kind of shopify the b2b world <laughs> yeah. for lack of a better terminology but i think big commerce is the only platform right now that i see that's positioned to kind of take b2b and make it really easy SaaS yeah. apps a lot out of the box they have the b2b bundle i don't know how much you've seen that but it's pretty cool company accounts yeah. requisition lists you know that kind of stuff you know, different payment options for different companies, companies versus customers. You could have both B2B and B2C on the same website. 
they're the yeah. only company that we've seen so far where it's like, hey, we can actually like do this and it's not some ridiculous, massive, complex project on a crazy infrastructure that's hard to manage, you know? I agree. When so many of the B2B sites like require something that really like crazy custom data modeling or something that's like, that yeah. just you're just, you're gonna, you're stuck having to build something that's gonna be inexpensive to manage and maintain. But if you can fit inside, if you're, if you can like adapt your requirements to fit inside a big commerce, yeah. you know, I don't like, absolutely. And I think the one of the reasons maybe no one's come up with a viable SaaS based B2B solution is you have to do, or B2B solution is that you have to do everything B2C does. And then there's like 10 things on top. Another right. additional yeah. layer of a bunch of things. And you have to be able to accommodate these crazy use cases where the ERP does this and you have to display, you know, real time pricing because based on the customer and like that, we do stuff like that. And that gets really complex because it's like, well, each customer is a different price and yeah. it's almost impossible to map that to the e-com platforms. So you have to like, yeah, there's all these workarounds and things that you can do, but. If there's a decision tree, I think it's like, you know, if Shopify had price lists and could do like, cause today with, you know, Shopify is predominantly like you got a price is a price, you know, and you yeah. can do log promotional logic against you it. You have like the wholesale apps. And they have some the apps wholesale like app I just dismiss. Yeah. yeah. But you know, like, I don't think Shopify even really pushes that anymore. So it's, no, but they have some apps that have like a wholesale oh, yeah. like app, but it's very lightweight. Like it could work for like, let's say a retailer that has some lightweight wholesale discounts or customers. Yeah. But it's yeah. not a viable like enterprise B2B solution, but you know. Well, yeah. and we did a, you know, we did a bunch of research over the years on like what are the minimum viable, like what's the minimum set of requirements to build a B2B solution. Yeah. Priceless. And, yeah. You know, yeah, it's like priceless organizational hierarchies, self-administration. You know, there's there, you know, got to be able to handle like purchase orders, subscriptions yeah. help, you know, like you gotta the tokenization things get hard for the SaaS platforms. But like I think a lot of that. Big commerce is the right fit for a lot of these because they're like you can replace the checkout. They have organizations you can yeah, they have company them. accounts, yeah, company accounts, price contract based pricing or price lists, yeah, um, and that right customer to groups on top of that too. So you can assign a customer group to a company account and kind of yep. mangle that in different ways. So yeah. So that's a lot of like I think that's a what that's a huge swath of the B two B market right there. I yeah. Think. Well, like, you know, and given given how big B two B is, it's surprising to me that no one else has come in to kind of compete with big commerce. Because I agree with your your both of your assessments. Really, I mean, B two big commerce really is like unique in in the space right now. There's mm -hmm. nobody else is doing exactly. Well, their stock is doing. down fifty percent, by the way. So <laughs> <laughs> that's a, I better buy it. I better buy it right now. Yeah. So. <laughs> Uh, if there's a stock that I'm investing in, I'll let you know. It's uh, and this is not this is purely just objective. I've I've learned a lot of failures and successes buying stocks, and one thing I've realized is the market just way over under indexes for years on things. Like I remember Tesla was the same for like yeah five years, and it was right before like the Model Three was like getting bigger, and I was like, it's probably time that they're gonna like break out. So I bought a little Tesla. Yeah. Nothing crazy. I'm, I'm not, I didn't have a lot of money at the time. Hmm. This was a few years ago. And sure enough, that was like that next quarter, the model three was like picking up and it just like hockey sticked up. Right. Like, mm -hmm. so if I had like actually got a little bit more serious and put like, you know, 10 grand into it, like I probably would have made like, so yeah, we're saying big commerce is here and then it's going to go like, yeah. That. And so I think that's what people don't realize is they see this, you know, like this and this and this and this. And then all and Shopify did the same thing. Eventually the snowball hits and it hits and then it just snowballs up, right? Yeah. And, and the market, especially Wall Street, is way behind the curve on that because they're like, they don't get the tech, they don't get the market, they don't really understand what's happening until it's already happened, you know? So if it stays yeah. where it is, I don't see how they don't get like bought out for $10 billion for five times, you know, Microsoft yeah. or someone just like and Trellis might be able to if it, if it <laughs> drops a little more, you know? <laughs> yeah, I'll raise a couple billion bucks and, and make a purchase. That'd be amazing. There, there you go. <laughs> you never know. I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, the only, I mean, obviously, you know, Magento is a viable option, but like, I think it's just too upstream for most companies. <clears throat> I mean, it's just, it's a beast to manage and maintain. It's, it's like, so, it's like, yeah. 
I think they have this vision of like microservice esque, where where the, every, you made everything a really great tiny component, you could extend anything. But it's like who's does you have to have like a freaking PhD to even understand. In yeah, terms of, the, the, the salaries are skyrocketing to keep the talents. You know, the projects we're doing just keep going kind of up and up. <laughs> and and we've been using kind of built big commerce to fill in those B two B gaps because we just are like very picky with what we do on Magento because it's so risky for us to do anything that's not a large budget in Magento because we're going to get burned. We've gotten burned a couple of times. We're like, oh, you know, we'll keep it simple. And then it just never ends up being simple. <laughs> so. And like, who else is there? There's Oro Commerce who you have, like, you often no them are brilliant. No like, ecosystem. No ecosystem. Just, no, 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 who the hell knows? How are you going to get, are you going to get an Oro Commerce engineer? Like, who the hell is going to know Oro Commerce? Who knows Oro Commerce? <laughs> Only if they already work with a brand that happen to have it. I mean, I don't know who else really would. I know one guy I heard on a podcast that uses it. And I think the only reason it works for him is because he built his entire business around it and doesn't have a separate ERP system. There you go. You know, so and it's like, I think he's very much in the Oro box, yeah. right? And maybe a couple apps and things like that. But so I think what's happening and why I think there needs to be consolidation is Let's say uh, I'm actually a seed investor, very small, like the minimum investment. It's my only seed investments. <laughs> I'm not like a big time seed investor in a in a um, in a startup um, uh, that does AR, VR, early stage. You know, hopefully getting like Series A eventually. Um, and they started out in the Shopify ecosystem, which makes sense. Simple, yeah. get up and running. Like there's no easy way install this app. We'll get you up and running on AR, VR, take your images, make them 3D, spin around, super like affordable compared to everything else in the market. That was kind of their proposition. I helped them navigate, you know, that I told them, you know, I think big commerce is the right set next place because it's SaaS, similar model, you know, mm -hmm. Magento is just too up market for them right now to, to play in that space. Mm -hmm. um, and so the point, long story short is this ecosystem like Trellis is part of the ecosystem we're a partner, right? There's only limited resources we have to invest in all these platforms, right? And, mm -hmm. and, and this company could only integrate with two or three at the time as a seed company, right? And maybe they'll get four or five. Even bigger companies are only picking three or four platforms. It's it's pretty much Shopify, big commerce, sometimes not big commerce because sometimes they get, but I think they're getting more and more higher up the chain. So it's Shopify, big commerce, Magento and Salesforce commerce cloud. Yeah. I don't see many tech vendors that even put any effort into any platform that's not those because it's just not worth it, right? Like, yeah. you know, you have the Shopify giant ecosystem, big commerce is growing, there's money there. Magento's Magento, there's money there. Salesforce is a beast, there's money there. Everything else is just like, why would you take the time to build an integration with some other platform right now. And, and like you I do just, have to make tough decisions. I mean, that's what's really, you know, I was I was head of, a, I was president of an agency for a while and you know, it's a while back and we had basically Magento teams. And then we had like small teams for other things like ATG, you know, yeah. which was a business for us in Salesforce, and that's it, right? We didn't really go deep in anything else because it's like, well, we'll just turn away the business for any of the other things or we'll focus yeah. people in on these and we won't build other teams. And that's really the decision that has to get made. And then that forces, you know, these other companies that are trying to create platforms into being useful, you know, having an ecosystem and having, you know, people learn how to use it. But yeah, sorry, that was a very long-winded, you know, explanation. That was good. Why I think that there needs to be consolidation because when everyone's trying to use a million platforms, no one has the time to learn all these things and build the ecosystem. Well, right? It's possible. <laughs> there's still nothing for like, like other than big commerce or Magento. There's still not if I'm a manufacturer and you know I've got I've got contract based pricing and I've got my, well, my customers are third party or, you know, other B2B organizations. There's not a lot of options out there for me. So I'm kind of screwed in a lot of situations. It's like, yeah. you know, like there's, there's, it's, it's really, really difficult for those folks. It's probably like good for the consultants and the agencies to help advise them, but yeah. there's, 
there's here's your two options. <laughs> it's like <laughs> pay me a bunch so, of money. Here's your two options. <laughs> sure, or, or they're very biased, and they I know some people that like know one of these other obscure things, and they push them into that right. And then or like, like, like insight that. seems pretty good. Whatever insight software. Yeah. Right? So the problem with insight. Good. Let's talk about insight because I do think they're not the worst option in the world. I, I've seen some people yeah. be okay with them. They, they were a decent platform, but very niche, tiny ecosystem, you know, uh, very B2B focused. But then mm -hmm. the thing that scares me is they are bought by Optimizely. Optimizely merged with Episerver or was it, was it Episerver? I don't remember. That sounds right, but I'm not sure. Mass company and they, that bought uh, Insight. So now Insight's tech is rolled up into this Optimizely ecosystem. Like, I don't even know what the real tech is. Is it insight? Is it optimized? Like what happens when you get on that thing? Are you stuck on this thing? And then like, how do you, is there an ecosystem? I just, I, it feels like it's a little far off in terms of. I know people at insight, so I apologize, but like, I don't think the platform's getting the, it can't be getting the R and D attention that it's needed, you know, like, no. and I don't think it's got the ecosystem. So it's kind of like the same problem that Magento has with Adobe, but probably a bigger problem because it's not, it doesn't have the ecosystem. Magento already had the ecosystem. Yeah. But Magento is getting rolled into the Adobe experience manager ecosystem, which is a hard problem to solve. Um, and they're trying to like, just figure it out on the fly on this like weird optimizely Epi server insight merger thing. So if you were like a really well-funded VC, is there an opportunity in the market to pour money into a potential new option? Or is it just too darn difficult to make a B2C platform that would even be the foundation to then build the B2C? I mean, I would probably just double down on big commerce for like the mid market. Like this yeah. is my kind of take on it. Big commerce for the small mid market, right? You know, if you don't have a lot of money, well, let's say your budget is 100 grand, 200 grand, 300 grand, big commerce, right? If you're a little above that, maybe you consider Magento, potentially still big commerce. Um, you're, you're kind of like, now you're in the echelon of, I can also consider a big Magento, <laughs> right? And then if I think, and then I think where it gets interesting and where I'm starting to do a lot more work and figuring out, there's this really fine line that I think starting to happen where now it's like Magento almost becomes a waste of money and you might as well just build a custom headless site that ties directly to your, your ERP systems and the back office systems. That you, mm -hmm. you know. But like, if you get to that certain point of money, then it's like, yeah you might as well start to go a little more custom, maybe get a React engineer. You're gonna end up spending so much money on one of these platforms anyways. And all it's gonna do is integrate with all these other systems to display the data from all these other systems <laughs> that you could just put headless on the front end anyways <laughs> and go direct to those systems. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. With the assumption that the most consumable option is the best option, so the decision tree becomes big commerce, mm -hmm. if it can accommodate, Fantastic, you're done. If it can't, then you're looking at Magento. Yeah. And what is beyond that, if all of a sudden you have something that's like extremely, I don't know, that Magento can accommodate, does Hybris become an option? Or I think Hybris you go custom, custom headless. Yeah. You give me the budget of a Hybris customer, I will build you a better site. <laughs> and that's a big budget, right? Custom I mean, at this site. point, you know, it's a massive architecture project. You need some really good architects. But you, Hybrid's just a middleman. At that point, it's all driven by the ERP and the PIM and all it's these other platforms. Yeah. You're right. You're just another layer of complexity, unnecessary complexity. Speaking of unnecessary complexity, yeah. and you know, a massive license fee, super expensive engineers, because who the hell does SAP Hybrid's development? <laughs> but, and at that and point, you take an OJS package, you know, you take an open source Node.js package. And yep. you build out the little pieces that you don't have from your other systems and for your own business needs. And then it all rolls up to the front end. Yeah, I mean, the way the way I look at it, just to answer your question, Jordan, was that the uh, if, if, if there were a ton of money from some player out there, you could probably build good competition for big commerce, but I'm not sure I would even do that, right? I mean, it's kind of interesting. It's like, I, I think that let them kind of continue to you know, take whatever space they're taking and then figure out how to do things above or below or around or with, or, you know, I, I'm not sure you need to build the multi-billion dollar competitor to be commerce right now. Well, yeah. 
Yeah, and Shopify's alluded to B2B things for years. And I honestly don't, I was just there and I don't even know, you know? So it's, <laughs> like, I know that there's, I know that there's like, like publicly- the Handshake, YouTube. what's going on with Handshake? Are you allowed to talk about that or? <laughs> it's, 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 kind of, it's, it's fair for Shopify stores, you know? And it's like across Shopify, you know, I don't, I, I'll i keep my, uh, Shopify is a wonderful, wonderful place. I, I will. Uh, <laughs> I don't want to hear any trouble, right? I don't want to hear any too, like angry calls from Toby calling you like after this. No, I'm, it's not like I'm, this is the biggest podcast in the world. By the way, we don't have. <laughs> <laughs> We're pretty much Joe Rogan, by the way. You know, no, no, no one. You know. Nerdy B two B people like me and you, Jordan and Tim, that are just. All around say, the world listening to this. You know? I can say whatever I want because no one is listening. It's like, <laughs> it's, a it. bad, it's like a bad AM sports show. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> Shopify doesn't have the foresight to be like, we should find the B2B Commerce podcast. Oh, it's run by Isaiah. They haven't, <laughs> they haven't, talked to me. They haven't even reached out to me. We're a partner. We probably sell more licenses of Shopify than like almost anyone else in North America. I don't even think they know we have, we have this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, oh man, it's, it's funny. Uh, but can I, I'm just throwing this out there because I'm starting, I'm kind of betting a lot on this. And I think that we're moving in this direction, uh, personally, professionally, in that we went through this period and you, you basically lived through it. Originally, it was probably all custom because there were no platforms, right? In like 2000s, like Amazon just won the custom game, right? And eBay. And then everyone else, you know, shit the bed because they couldn't figure it out. And then eventually ATG and whatever, it's like, oh, we don't need to build this. Cole's like building this from scratch is too hard, right? Just too hard. It's, it's, so then you, you know, you have the platforms, you work your way up and, and, and that's where we are today. Yeah. I think we're at a new point now where if you have, I'm just going to make up, this is kind of a made up number, but I think it's fairly reasonable. If you have half a million to a million budget, really more like a million plus instead of dumping all that money to SAP Hybris or general enterprise, you're better off building a custom headless site tied to your back office systems, hiring one or two react engineers, building out a small tech team that hires an agency like trellis. So it's hybrid. And we're doing this with some customers right now where you have you know, a couple engineers in house trellis as a, you know, you have kind of like some layers of, you know, backups of we're busy or they are, you know, it's not like, like you said, the site doesn't go down because one guy's on PTO, you have us and them and, you know, a few layers here. And there's a lot of tech and headless, right? It's not like all this stuff is custom. It's like we're using Vercel and all these like head, we're just bringing together a lot of things mm -hmm. and getting away the useless licenses, which are essentially the e-commerce platforms because all they are is just an order management system that is not as good as your actual order management system or a PIM that's not as good as your real PIM, or an ERP, which is not as good as your ERP. <laughs> it's, still, it's still like, it still seems folly to try to recreate a pricing engine in a shopping cart sometimes when- You don't have to recreate a pricing engine, you just use the ERP's pricing engine. That's true, yeah, that's fair, yeah. So it becomes a layer on top of the ERP essentially. Exactly. Yeah. You know, I'm not recreating anything. We're just taking the data that's already being used in these systems. And instead of having to take the pricing engine of the ERP, and figure out how to mash it into an e-commerce platform, which is nearly impossible. We just display it on the front end. Mm -hmm. Yep. So maybe that's the. Is there a? Is there like a B two B version of Nacelle or something like that? You know, that I am working on a project, uh, but it's more complex than that. It's actually on the design side. So we are going to be looking for seed investors. Um, mm -hmm. We're focusing more on the front end layer, mm -hmm. um, and then. The problem with the nacelles that I see in the world is they're all the middleware layer, which is great, but then you still have to build all the front end. And what happens with some of the things that you still have to end up custom building stuff on the middleware layer because your ERP is different than the app they have. And then now you're paying for another expensive middleware layer that doesn't actually solve your problems. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> where you just build it custom, yeah, it's a little maybe a little more upfront, but paying for selling some of these things a lot cheaper than paying a giant license fee. Yeah. You know? So, so, that, so, so I got to ask you, Jordan, you, you okay. know, you, you made this big transition, right? You, you've, uh, you've left uh, a place you went where you were shot by six years, something like that. Yeah. 
Six right? years. Yep. Six years. That's a long time. So, so you know, you have this this vision for yourself having a an agency. Is that what you're thinking? I want to make sure I understand this uh, or a consultancy. I want to see. I'm getting an idea for our listeners. <laughs> Joe is a gun for hire right now. If you want, yes, if you want. yes. <laughs> I just want to make sure everyone hears. Yeah, yeah. If you have complex B two B requirements and you're looking for someone to come in and, and put together a go to market strategy, then no, I um, my plan was to get the brand side really quick, and I think I've been spending a lot of time with um, technology, e commerce technology, like apps in the Shopify ecosystem. You know, known email marketing or you know, like uh, solutions and others to, because that's kind of where my relationships were. So I'm definitely spending a lot of time right now and go to market for, for technology. Um, there's a really cool company I'm working with called Viral, which is it's, you know, in, it's a uh, search within basically a uh, social video. So they do, they'll aggregate all of the YouTube videos, all of the soon TikTok and Instagram videos that talk about your product. And then it does like really cool analytics can push the videos out to your product detail page. But that's just like one example of, of a startup that I'm working with. Sure. Um, but I do want to get on the brand side quick. I'm actually in Toronto this week because I'm talking to, you know, perspective. Uh, um, it's a newspaper actually on like go to market strategy. So I don't know that I have the vision. Like I, I'm sure I should be pitching a vision of what I want, but you know, I'm <laughs> It, the reality is it's, I'm just having a lot of fun figuring out as I go. You know? We're just going to tell all of our listeners to find you and contact you. You know, that's a really yeah, yeah. I, I, that's I really think uh, some of these B2B companies need to, to, to pick your brain and they're going to well, get a lot of value and probably save a lot of pain just by maybe paying you a few hours just to talk to you. So mm -hmm. um, sometimes that a couple hours can literally save someone from wasting hundreds of thousands of dollars. You know, that's definitely, that's <laughs> I think the long-term vision is like, you know, like Shopify's changed the world for the D2C entrepreneur. Well, there's like, that's 5% or 1% of our economy, you know, like there's like an entire world of other industries that need to be disrupted still yeah. by like new go-to-market strategies around e-commerce or other technology, you know, whether you're in the yeah. auto industry or whether you're a manufacturer, again, pharma or whatever. So it's kind of like, or here I'm meeting with a newspaper, you know, like looking to overhaul digital. So there's, um, yeah, there's just a whole world out there of interesting problems to solve with an e with like a D to C e-commerce lens, you know? Yeah, I, I think that's a great way to look at it. It's like Shopify completely revolutionized. It's more than one percent. Let's let's give them some justice. No, we're right? not. No, no, no. <laughs> Three million stores. It's clearly a, a yeah. But yeah. what, what I mean by that is it's not just the the Shopify. It's like there's all of retail. What let's say you know. Three percent, uh, yeah, three trillion, or maybe it's more than that. Six trillion of the U.S. economy, and Shopify, I think, has even though it's maybe only doing a small percentage of the total retail, I think it completely revolutionized all of retail. Absolutely, it forced like, everyone to kind of like it, massively adapt towards either having a better site, POS, and just a better overall experience, even if they're not using Shopify. And the order is important. At this point in time, Shopify has done more to revolutionize like human to human commerce than I would argue like any company in the world, except from like, of course, Amazon, but you know, yeah. like, but that's yep. just, that's just Amazon selling you shit, even if it's. Yeah, exactly. It's so that's not distributed. True. It's like all one behemoth. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't even call that trade, you know, I, you know, I, <laughs> I guess it yeah. is, you know, but it's, so no, it's, Shopify's done more to change the world. And I, I think other industries perspective of what can be done in a more consumable manner than anyone else yeah we need that in other industries right like there's still too many industries where like the experience of shop where it's so easy to buy especially in b2b is the perfect example of b2b commerce it's just like it's just not there and it's just so hard to buy in so many of these other industries banking banking is oh my god don't get me <laughs> started on banking i have to uh sign some we're, we're moving banks i have to because of covid by the way i think they like won't come to our office but we need to like basically like screen share and show that we're signing the documents and it's like this whole problem and i'm busy and like they couldn't coordinate with me and the other guy at our company to sign at the same time it's like become this like ridiculous process just to like move over and bank with them it's like and they're better than some of the other ones that's why we're going to that <laughs> it's just like it's just hilarious to me that like it, you know everything we're doing nowadays is like docusign or we use canada 
But because it's a bank, I got to show them in my video that this is me signing. A... <laughs> well, you know, I'll, t I'll tell you guys just one funny, funny little tidbit about banking stuff. So years ago, I was working with a guy who was actually one of the inventors of the ATM. So you can imagine he was quite elderly at the time, but he was- I hope he uh, made a lot of money, ironically. Cause... Oh, he did. He became <laughs> a top like tech guy in Citibank and Citicorp. So, but he said that at the time when, when they were doing that, there were all of these people who were bringing in from tech, you know, from like IBM or whatever at the time. And they thought that this was going to be a burst of excitement and banking and all kinds of innovation. And he says, after the ATM, nothing happened. Like, basically, that was the innovation for like 20 years. And he was, <laughs> he was always like, this is good enough. Let's stick with this for 30 years. And yeah, but he was like, and they poured <laughs> tons of money into it. They made it so exciting. It was the thing. And then it was just like, that was it. Right? So, oh, no. I kind of hope that's like, I mean, yeah, like, like if I had to have hopes for my own future, and even this is probably like applicable to a lot of the agencies out there as well. It's like, take we're on the newspaper I'm meeting with today. I'm like, I don't know anything about newspapers. You know, they're like, well, you know, like that's why we find you interesting, you know. And if taking the knowledge that we've learned in direct to consumer, like what working with direct to consumer entrepreneurs or luxury apparel retail brands, and translating it to all these other industries. You know, like there's like we don't need necessarily to be the expert on HIPAA compliancy. There's someone else who does that. Yeah, you, you work know? with them and you partner with them and you guys You're right. figure it out together, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so build some crazy software that makes it really easy, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's weird to me, like no one ever cared about what I did. You know, like I'd be like, oh, I'm the e-commerce guy, and like no one gave a shit, you know, for, for years. And now I'm like I'm finally cool. It's amazing. You know, it's just, <laughs> for the first time people actually want to talk to the guy who knows a lot about e-commerce. So. Sure. so all we need you to do is you're going to, you're going to fix the government. You're going to go fix healthcare. <laughs> it's the b2b and then we're good that like that's most of the things we need and then you know it's and, and when you do part. those things you know, come peace. back and yeah, tell and us the about R&B is, <laughs> like, is part of the government so you gotta fix the R&B maybe some state <laughs> too so oh man they're, like you said there's just there's so much behind the scenes I think that's maybe what people don't appreciate is all that goes into the final consumer product that the experience of that Shopify buy and you get it to your door, everything that before that is so complex and still fairly archaic to oh, get absolutely. to that point, right? It's coming on like a boat from China, yeah. <laughs> stuck in a port because it's COVID, so it like can't go anywhere. And then <laughs> oh, so man. true, so true. So we should give you uh, the you know the last word really as we get uh, close to wrapping up. I mean, is there something uh, else you wanted to talk about here or is another hot topic for you, Jordan? Anything, anything exciting for our listeners? No, I mean, what an exciting time to be in e-commerce. And when you talk, so many of the VCs you talk to, they all want to like understand Shopify's like app ecosystem and, you know, but like, I don't like, yes, of course, you know, like it's not going anywhere. It's going to continue to excel, and, you know, like, but there's the, the real opportunity for me is in everything else, you know, like, it's in all the other industries, like how much money is spent, how many billions or trillions of dollars or who knows, oh, some, like, auto, auto parts, you know, yeah. just like, mm -hmm. like, just like, just the auto, like how many, all the direct to consumer auto parts sites are atrocious, you know, like yeah. you can't find anything yeah. and there's. You can't trust it. I don't even trust it to come to me. No, <laughs> like, I don't know. No. like inventory <laughs> reliability is like zero for most of these yep. sites. So um, there's just, yeah, there's, there's such, incredible opportunities out there and if you're a vc investor you should be looking outside of just traditional direct-to-consumer and then you should hire me you you know what it is it's just it's not sexy right and that's what i think people are missing and, and why i've invested a lot of my career in b2b like b2b e-commerce it's not sexy it's like oh i'm the expert on b2b e-commerce <laughs> no one yeah. no one's like oh man that's so cool like no. but it's so important it's like it's it's going to save people like trillions of dollars of time. If we solve this problem, we're like literally saving trillions, of like a cut, like say we Shopify the B2B e-commerce, it's trillions of dollars of time being wasted that could be made semi-automated or automated or better experience, right? And I don't want to be working in the area, like the area that's like really cool, that's hot. It's kind of like you already missed the boat, you know, like 
Sorry. Exactly. Yeah. That, that's the thing. Yeah. You're already too late. <laughs> You're, yeah. you know. I want to work in the area that is like everyone thinks is cool. And then when it starts becoming cool, I'm already on to the uncool thing again. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's, it. that's the right answer. Well, like so far, you know, the podcast is growing, but I don't know if we've quite made it cool yet. I'm not sure. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, we're we're like saw me on the street and like, oh. oh, you run that podcast? That's so cool, man. That, that, no. that hasn't happened yet. <laughs> probably nothing cool about this discussion but you know, so we're, getting we're getting there we're getting oh man i'm sure cardi b is going to tweet about us so, or something. so jordan can we have you back um maybe you know hopefully when you've kind of landed in this next yeah. thing and you're figuring this out maybe you're working for a vc and b2b and i feel like you're going to have a whole new kind of eye lens on things to tell us that That'd be great. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm enjoying just discovering, you know, there's so much new, so many new and interesting startups. And it's just like, I'm just, it's, I'm kind of like people are paying me to have fun and just educate myself right now. So that sounds awesome. That's, <laughs> that's really great. Well, uh, thank you for being a great guest. And uh, I guess this is wrapping up episode 65 of the Hard Truth About B2B e Commerce. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you.